Welcome to tonight's webinar. We're happy to have you with you, have, have you with us. Um, this is a momentous occasion. Uh, we have two fantastic uh, clinicians with us uh, to discuss things tonight. Peter Nordland is going to talk about a little bit about um, not what he ordinarily talks about. He's going to talk about virology. He's going to talk about uh, an interview that he's had with Dr. Jorgen Slots, which is fantastic. And then uh, Danny Melker is going to carry the whole thing and is going to, going to talk about how we save teeth, how we talk with each other. Restorative dentists, I know there are a lot of restorative dentists on, and periodontists working together um, to uh, save teeth. And it's, uh, if, if, we're, if you haven't heard Danny before, you're about to be introduced to a concept that is going to be, um, uh, could be revolutionary in your practice, and particularly during this time when we don't know what we're going back to. And when people are saying, I want an alternative to what I've ordinarily been, uh, has been recommended to me, I think it's gonna, it's gonna open up our eyes as to how we can work together as teams to be able to be, to, to be able to create a, um, uh, a wonderful outcome and a long lasting outcome um, for our patients. Uh, with us also is uh, practice consultant, Danielle Samella, and she will talk uh, more about what we do in our own practice to be able to, uh, or how you can work in your practice to be able to talk about these different alternatives and it'll be after Danny, after Danny speaks. And uh, so uh, we thank you um, for joining us. I've got to tell you, this is the largest webinar I've ever hosted. We have almost 500 people signed up for this webinar. So um, that's how interested you are. So uh, congratulations. And uh, as a bonus to you, um, there will be continuing education credit for this webinar. Uh, the Oral Reconstruction Foundation has been kind enough uh, to, um, uh, to provide continuing education credit. You will get it in about a week. We will be taking attendance. We will know how long you've been here. Uh, please, with 500 people, don't ask me about where your CUs are. You will get them uh, in about a week. Um, for those of you who are interested and want to know about recordings, let me just put this on the screen. Okay, um, this entire series, and we've been doing a, a series uh, uh, for the past four or five weeks, that entire series is available at, at this um, website location. You'll be able to get all of the recordings. They're not all up right now, but as long as you send, um, as long as you enter or just click on it, you don't have to get any links, you don't have to sign up or anything. Uh, just click on it, uh, put, put, put your name, and when the recordings are available, which will probably be Monday, uh, you'll get the, you'll be able to get the recordings of every one of the uh, webinars we've done. Last week's webinar, for example, is how to legally protect yourself from getting against uh, getting uh, negative Google reviews and uh, fascinating uh, subject that uh, may be uh, very important um, to all of us. So with that, uh, let's talk with Dr. Peter Nordland first. Uh, Peter, we're concerned about how our staff is going to react when they come back and how well are they protected, uh, how well patients are protected, how well we're protected. And you had a good conversation with Dr. Jorgen Slon. So you tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Well, last week, having conversation with Lee Sheldon, Dr. Sheldon asked me, what are some of the things you're doing in California? And he suggested that I reach out to Jorgen Slots, who probably most of you know is the main guy responsible for developing the techniques we use for adding bleach to the water pick, to adding bleach in mouth rinses to be able to help our patients without infection. And I've had the blessing of using his technique for a long time now, using that in terms of the water pick around bleach or with bleach, uh, especially around ailing implants. I've seen some situations that have turned around dramatically. So Dr. Sheldon asked me, why don't you reach out to, to Dr. Slots to see if he's got any other tidbits or suggestions. And so I did. So last Saturday, I called Jorgen and I ended up speaking with him at length, not only Saturday, but Sunday as well. And so he gave me some really good ideas. And as a result, I ended up contacting the LA Times, the San Diego Union Tribune, and even some of the national networks, because I think that some of this information could be really helpful for, for us, our staff, and our patients. So I wrote up 
a blurb from our conversations, and I thought I would just read it to you. And if you would like, I'm happy to send it to Dr. Sheldon, and they can make this available for you and your offices. So I entitled it, A Simple and Effective Measure to Protect your, the Spread of COVID-19 Virus. As we all know, dentistry is in the face of patients daily and creates aerosols using dental handpieces and ultrasonic scalers. This puts the profession at great risk for cross-contamination with bacteria and viruses. There's some simple things we can do to minimize COVID-19 virus outbreak risk. So what are some of the things that dentistry can be doing? <clears throat> uh, Dr. Jurgen Slots has been a professor of microbiology at the Austro USC School of Dentistry for many years. He is also a virologist. His recommendations have helped mitigate dental infections for over 25 years. And he's published on this research on the topic numerous well refereed well journals. Dentistry and individuals can protect ourselves by doing a few simple steps. And I've been incorporating this with my family also while we're at home daily. So number one is to rinse for 30 seconds three times a day using a mouth rinse made by mixing one part sodium hypochlorite, regular household bleach with 30 parts water. So I've done that and we do that in the house and we all do that three times a day. The bleach should be an aqueous form liquid, not gels or scented formulas. Sometimes you see the different formulas are, and they have added chemicals in them like pine scented, you don't want any of that. Number two, <clears throat> swab the nares inside of the nose three times a day with a Q-tip soaked in betadine. So we will do that. I'll take a Q-tip, soak it in betadine, and then swab the inside of the nose of my entire family. And it doesn't have a bad taste, bad odor, anything. The bleach is, takes a little bit of getting used to. So these simple steps using common, easily found household items can help avoid cross-contamination and minimize risk and spread of the virus. I didn't really realize this, but Dr. Slots educated me that when we're, our body's attacked by viruses and bacteria, that macrophages are our first line of defense. And the biggest chemical attack from macrophages is actually sodium hypochlorite within the their cells themselves. So it's a natural attack and it's something that I think I'm having gonna, I have, I'm gonna start with my office staff doing it in the morning, lunchtime, at the end of the day, and doing it with patients too. So I think that's something that we could all use right away. Hope it helps. I think it will help. Um, you know, Jorgen's been doing this for a long time. And of course, he was the first that I know of, Peter, that identified viruses as being one of the causative agents of uh, periodontitis. Yep. Yep. So, um, good. Well, I appreciate your talking with him for me and for all of us. I think we've all benefited. Dr. Danny Melker and I met each other, what, Danny, 15 years ago, did you say? 15? 15 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, at the time, I, and I, I, was a very active periodontal practitioner and I visited Danny, I took his course and it literally changed the way I practice dentistry. And I want you to understand something. We have a fairly substantial dental implant practice, but um, there are opportunities that many of us miss out on. And that's what Danny taught me on how to be able to save teeth, save teeth that we may have been trained, particularly if we're younger, younger than I am that we're trained, well, that's got a purgation involved, we're gonna lose that tooth anyway, we might as well get it out now. And I've gotta tell you that when I started using Danny's techniques, and Danny and I figured out it was 2004, 2005, I was able to save a lot more teeth, I was able to save those teeth in comfort and in health, and they've stood uh, the test of time. At this particular time, when we're going back to our practices and we're not exactly sure how things are going to be, we do know one thing. We know that that people, as opposed to when I first started practicing, 
people know what dental implants are and have an inflated sometimes idea as to what dental, dental implants are um, and have a deflated idea of what teeth are. And I think we've reached a point, particularly when we're in this critical uh, juncture right now where we've been out of practice for a number of weeks and we're coming back to be able to offer, offer uh, patients uh, alternatives. And who better to teach that uh, than Danny Melker? So Danny, it's all yours. Okay, let's go to the screen. Share. Okay, team. Let's go right to it. Uh, basically, those that, those of you that know me, I'm really simple. I haven't changed probably in 40 years. And that is, I was brought up keeping teeth and I'm going to die with have never placed an implant. I think they're really awesome. My problem is living in Clearwater, Florida, I happen to work with a dozen or so dentists that could keep about anything. So once we made a decision to keep teeth, it was quite a, kind of a really pretty easy for me. And so when we're looking at this case, this is a patient that came to me from New York and with her bridge in her hand, and she was slated to have all her teeth extracted, and would there be any other option? The average probing was about three millimeters. This was just a, a very simple case because all we had to do in the, where you see the, the circles, is really build some cores up, composite bonded resins, and then really do some minor surgery. Of course, we looked at the endo. We, we replaced any uh, posts that, that were in there. We don't like posts particularly, particularly with cores. I think the endo posts really came about when cores came about in like 1985. So this case that was slated for extractions was really a very simple case. It really demanded no perio. It was entirely restorative. And this is what changed the world, in my opinion. And unfortunately, I don't think we jumped along with it the way we should have, which is taking teeth that look bad on the left, as you can see, and when a core is placed, it's like the tooth was, nothing was ever done. It's not broken down, it's perfect. And a true composite bonded resin done in a dry environment properly doesn't come out. I've had talks with, Periodontist, well, they don't last, they don't work. I have a periodontist, that, you know, he's a, good, he's a friend of mine. And I said, well, when you do certain things, he didn't know what I was talking about as far as antimicrobials. He didn't understand about decontamination. Nothing works if it's not done properly. And what I find and what I decided to do back around 1975 was I wanted to treat the cause, not the effect. To me, when you do surgery, that's treating the effect. If you're gonna do pocket elimination, did you treat the cause or did you treat the effect? Well, the pocket's the effect. So I started thinking, what were the causes and I was trying to do that. So here we are with endo and you're gonna say, what the heck's he talking about endo? Because watch the difference. Here you have a fairly substantial lesion, maybe it's endo, maybe it's perio, but notice the accessory canal and notice the healing. In other words, you could have done a root canal if you didn't get the accessory canal when it worked. Look at the lesion down here, and you know I talk about apicos, and the reason I don't like them is because basically, if if you've got the problem here and you do an apico, you never solve the problem. But every time that I would see a case like this where we got to the actual cause, everything went away. Look how large this lesion is. A tiny accessory canal. 100% healing. So I, I apply this to, to perio, that if I could start treating the causes and not the effects, then probably maybe the effect will never come back again, or at least come back long enough that I, I'd be happy. And again, there it is. What appears to be tremendous lesions, you could say. Now, again, I try to equate this to, if you look at the case, people say, how do you know it was in there? How do you know it was perio? Well, when I have a patient that has bone that looks this way, perfect teeth, What's the likelihood that one tooth has perio? It could be a fractured tooth, but it's either a fractured tooth or endo, but it's not perio. So sometimes you can make your own decisions just by looking at everything. If it's Because people say, how'd you know it was endo? Do you think in a case like this, perio even entered into it? Look at the, the height of bone. And again, here's a case that on the left, it was probably about seven millimeters. It looked to be perio, except again, there was no real periodontal problems anywhere else. And to me, we treated the endo and the problem got all better, 
100% healing. So my point being, apply endo to perio. If you, to me, if I can't treat the cause, I really don't want to do the case because it's going to come back. So I opt for always trying to treat the cause. I always don't. And with the, the advent of COVID, I, I put this in here because it's very interesting that we all know there's a problem with the immune response. We love it. We need it. But it can handpick out bad guys and good guys. As Peter said, it releases these, these enzymes to destroy the bacteria and the toxins or so on but it also kills healthy tissue. So there is no good inflammation if we can avoid it. Now, certainly we need it, but wouldn't it be better if we didn't even have it happen? So the immune system sends the white blood cells, the antibodies and so on. That's just taken right out of, the, uh, out of a textbook and like macrophages. But what's the problem? We're gonna do damage when we do good. Now, this I owe pretty much to Bill Strupp, uh, probably 99% of all the success that I've ever had is really restoratively. And, and every restorative dentist that I've worked with has made me look good. And to me, as I say to everybody, this is a restorative world. If you want to be a great periodontist, you got to hook up with great restorative dentists. It's just the way it's going to be. But let's see what causes inflammation. We're really going to stop at the first three. Biologic with invasion, we know. Cement sepsis, we know. And margin irritation. All three, to me, in my area, can be some of the largest causes of periodontal problems. Certainly plaque and bacteria and so on. But what I tend to see is a lot of people that have come down and have had a lot of restorative work done. And it's not that it's bad restorative work. It's very interesting. We always like to say, well, that's bad. Some of the work that's done in the 1970s and 80s, we thought we would bury a margin as far as we could go. That was great. Never have a problem again. Now we know we were doing things we shouldn't have. So it simply comes out to be, I can eliminate all three problems if I just leave a margin super gingival. If we just simply change that one aspect of it and we don't go subgingival, we just eliminated three causes of periodontal problems by one technique. And so I can take this case that was done by a A plus restorative dentist. And when we go blindly under the tissue, this is an A plus restorative dentist. He's got open margin, he's got bonding material, he's got start of decay. And when he asked me to look at the patient, he said she's not brushing her teeth. The problem is I couldn't find any plaque. So I take the 40 years that I've been doing this and I sit and say to myself, what's the common denominator? of a lot of these things. And one was, whenever we left the margin super gingival, we didn't seem to have a problem. And we never got decay. You know, when back in the uh, late 70s when we were doing this stuff, uh, you know, some of the dentists I work with said, no, the teeth are going to rot away. You're going to get decay. You can't leave the margin super gingival. They'll rot away. That never, ever happened because we could take care of the area. And we're going to cover re other reasons. But again, this is the other side. This is an A dentist bonding material, a one millimeter open margin a short margin, a short margin. If this all happened super gingivally, you know what would happen to the tissue? Nothing. The tissue would, wouldn't even know what ever happened. So I found that's a big factor. Now this was done in 1976 or 75. And very simply, a patient came to me, she didn't want the crowns redone. And I said, well, you know what, if there's decay, they're gonna rot away, I can't help it. But, you know, so there's just what, look what's there, cement, open margin, bone loss already. And so what I did was, I just, just, you know, I annihilate everything. Again, to me, I just go in there and just, obli I just obliterated everything, got everything high and dry away. And if you look at it years later, no decay, no even replacement of the crowns, but look at the tissue. That's what happens when you leave the tissue alone. There's a very simple thing, stay away from biology, never go near it, and you'll always be happy. And the tissue stayed that way, never changed. And we got what's called a parabolic architecture, which is periodontist, we know bone and soft tissue have to mimic each other. And it kind of bothered me in the last couple of years, we, you know, we all are in the uh, forum, started talking about maybe we don't need to do osseous surgery. And I, I would grip my teeth and just try to stay out of discussion because yeah, when you start skipping steps, and you, then you say, well, it didn't work, then maybe you need to figure out why it didn't work. We can't skip steps. So we went from this 30 years later 
a healthier mouth than when we started 30 years prior. One big problem that I saw happening was we started doing everything by probing. The older guys can remember when Procter and Gamble came out and gave us, if we probed three areas of a quadrant, we could tell what type of disease there is. And we did everything by probing. What I found out, probing was the biggest misleading problem there ever was. So I say the depth of probing is irrelevant and you're gonna think about it and you know I'm gonna be right because the reality of it is, and restorative, but biologic with invasion only happens with a healthy tooth. Can't happen with a paralytic involved tooth unless someone really, really goes deep. But usually what happens is you're chasing decay you know, you want to replace an old crown or there's some decay and you just go down there and you're a little deeper than you thought. But the reality is you're in a biologic width. And what's the problem with the biologic width? There's only one. It's a living tissue. So when you start to invade it, you're going to set off the inflammatory response and the rest is going to happen. And again, I, I break people down. Into, there's, there's general dentists, there's restorative dentists, restorative specialists, and periodontists. There's many. But when I see general dentists giving and talking and talking about, well, you can invade the biologic width and it's going to heal back and everything, I've never seen that happen. And I'll bet most Paradox 99 have never seen biologic width invasion happen where the bone just beautifully moved away and everything was great. It's going to create a problem. And so when we do our exams, and what I'm trying to do here is build the restorative dentist exam so he's a periodontist. And then the periodontist you're going to see has to become a restorative dentist. The only way for this to really work is when you two work together and you do each other's part for them. But the problem is most people, most hygienists are taught to vertically probe a frication where we all know the real problem is the horizontal portion. And so the neighbor's probe to me just never changed. I've never seen anything better. It's in our office. It just sits there. We used to go around and that's how we would do our, we do our vertical probing and then come back to every molar and do our, our others. Now, this is a case that Howard Chasson was doing that I think is extremely rewarding for a restorative dentist because he's doing a core. And notice what we find here. We actually find that the old margin has separated the frication. There, this is a non-restorable tooth. It's impossible to restore. Yes, you can do it, but your bonding material or your cement, cement is going to flow into the frication. And we're going to talk later how to get rid of it. But so how many people get that? I got that because I have a restorative specialist that also is interested in, in learning these things. And so this to me is, is worth a million dollars. Look what I've got. I've got proof. When you start screwing around with old margins, you can't just do another margin. It's going to be even worse. And there's a frication. And so this is another case, but Howard did it. And we're going to, I'll show this later. But what, look what's interesting here. There was the same type of margin, and the core flowed. The core flowed right into the frication. And so, when people tell me they can do this with their eyes closed, you know, they don't need to lay a flap. I'm not going to argue with them. I'm just going to say I know when I lay a flap, I can correct everything that's there because I can see it. So you've got the core there, and then we go ahead and the core piece flows in. We're going to do our, you know, we're talking about it, you know, in a little while, but. We're going to get rid of the core material and we're going to leave the bone alone. We're not, you, first of all, you can't crown lengthen a frication because bone always moves coronally, as we'll talk about. Bone is moving coronally, but the problem is solved by getting rid of the old margin, not by removing bone. And so I think this is great for hygienists. I, I, you know, I kind of love these slides because you can't fake a slide. Our, our photo, or you can't if you look at it, but here's a Duralon, that's where we use our provisional cement. And the Duralon is super gingival, so is the old margin. There's a problem, only probing one millimeter. So a lot of, I, when I used to put this on a certain forum, all the general dentists would say, oh, that's malpractice. You don't need to do surgery. You just need, you're you know, trying to make a lot of money. And then I would explain to him, them or whatever, in fact, that margin was the height or the roof of the frication. That's a non-restorable tooth. Unless you can say to the cement or the bonding material, don't flow in there, it's going to flow in there. So we you know, developed a little method 
and the method was simply, you know, that's horizontal, is to get rid of the margins. So, so far what I'm doing is correcting restorative. Is it bad restorative? Absolutely not. Because when we were trained in the 70s, the 80s, and early 90s, we thought it was great to go under the gums. And then there's articles written that we now know that you can't just go down and do another margin, you'll even be deeper into the frication. But the entire problem was solved never touching the bone, just touching the old margin and just obliterating at this point, there is no margin left. That's biologic shape. So a 17 year old lady, come, young lady comes into your office and she just had a crown placed and it's not fitting, it's got an open margin and she's 17 years old. And you really can't do, you, you can't do crown lengthening here because you, you would have to destroy the bicuspid. So what's your other options to do extraction and do an implant? That's an option, but not in a 17 year old. I think we would all agree that would not be a good one. And you can see what's going on there. And then the beauty of this, so when I open it up, there's the old margin right there. That's simply the previous old margin. And then along with it, it's, this crown has been in less than a year. And look at the, the crater defect caused by the, the margin, the biologic with invasion, the setup of the inflammatory response, the immune system, the release of, of enzymes that destroy, they can't pick out and just kill the bacteria. They're, what else are they gonna do? They're gonna destroy your own bone. You can't say to them, stop, you're, you're, you're killing my bone. So again, what's our options here? We, we have to get rid of the crater, but that's very simple. Cause that's usually, you know, that's easy. So we got rid of the crater and we created a parabolic architecture. So again, what did I do? I removed the old margin. I never really started to think about anything else. What was the cause of the problem? The biologic with invasion. So if we remove the old margin, basically we know this. <clears throat> Every periodontist that's listening knows this. That biologic width is going to establish wherever it wants. It has nowhere to go. It can go whatever it wants. There's no margin dictating. So it flows to wherever it wants. And one of the biggest problems that I feel, at least in my opinion, is overlooked is how important connective tissue is. And the problem that we have is with the biologic width, we got a whopping one millimeter connective tissue. So if there's two things so far I can tell you in my life that changed long-term results for us was one, perfect restorative done by perfect restorative dentist and always putting in 10 yards of connective tissue. I couldn't put in enough. Every time I didn't put in enough, that was the problem. So basically I went in and I would, you know, I learned, fortunately I went to BU and I learned how to do graphs in 19, what, 73 or whatever. So they were nothing to me. But the point is, this is a fact. This is an indisputable fact that the only protection to the periodontal foundation is connective tissue. It is the only tissue in the mouth that prevents bacterial infiltration. So if you build up connective tissue, you know what you've done? You've made it so that bacteria can't do a, lot, a whole lot wrong. You know, we don't get breakdown quickly. It takes a long time for bacteria to do anything with connective tissue. Why? Because it's, it's very few vascularity. Then the key to connective tissue is, is it attached or not? Because sometimes you could have keratinized connective tissue for seven millimeters and probe seven millimeters. So in fact, you have no protection. Looks beautiful, but it's not good. Now I do this really because this is how easy it is to diagnose a lot. And what this is about really is as a team, which to me is I would go nowhere in the world. I never could be here today if it wasn't for the restorative dentist, but like the hygienist, if I see a case where there's recession and I see a case where there's no attached gingival and, and mucosa as it is here, I already know what's underneath. So does every periodontist here, no bone. So literally I know when my cases are bad. So if my hygienists get attuned to this and I'm thinking more restoratively than periodontally, but they start to pick up and they can say, Dr. So-and-so, you know, we've got a problem here because we all know the hygienists are key to a practice, a restorative practice, because they get an hour. You know, we get one minute to walk over and go hi and make sure we say hello, but it's the hygienists, the smarter they are, the better off we are. And this is a 17 year old young lady. And you can already say, I see the recession. I see the lack of attached, attached tissue and I see all mucosa. 
boom. So it's very easy to pick it up. And more importantly, it's very easy to treat. There's, I figure right now, about 150 different ways to cover a root. And not one's better than the next. Although you hear, this is better than, you know, every time another way comes out, they give another name to the same way, but it's all the same thing, basically. And so being stuck in the 1970s, I still love palatal tissue. I just can't change. I love to see that postage stamp that other people may not like. I think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And what I do at my exams, as we all do, is I feel the buckles to feel prominent roots. And I know if I feel a prominent root, there's not going to be a whole lot of bone. And sure enough, there's not. And, you know, when I first started doing this, maybe in 1969, when I was at Emory, this would freak me out. You know, as time went on, I realized, who cares? Because once I put the connective tissue there, I don't care if there's no bone there or not. I've got a barrier. And so when I look at this, where some may say, oh, that's terrible, my patients have been told by me that if you have tissue that's a light pink, almost white, that means it's the strongest tissue you can have. I've never had one patient say, no, I don't want to see it. Because they all know nobody sees it but the lip. So this whole baloney about, oh, it's ugly and it's terrible, that was made up by us. So you go in there and you just do your work. I, I, you know, I did what I had to do. And, you know... I didn't even try to cover the roots and it pushed it up on its own. And, and uh, you know, 22 years later, I, I know there's no bone there. You all saw it, yet, yet the thing's healthier. And by the way, there's plaque there. Look at the plaque, but there's not a whole lot going wrong. And that's the beauty of connective tissue. It's a barrier. And the last thing we want for restorative dentistry, I think but all we, we would all agree is vascular tissue. That would be the worst possible tissue we could have. In fact, anywhere really, because it, again, it allows bacteria to go underneath the tissue and it can release endotoxins. And this was a case I didn't want to do, but my restorative dentist said to me, really just do it, I don't really care. You know, I'll take the lumps. And I said, nah, don't do it. I ended up doing it and look who was right, not me, but him. This, I could see through this tissue. So all I had to do was learn what I've been telling everybody else, but I didn't use it for myself but a major dehiscence, you know, I have people say, what's the big deal? You know, it's just a little bone loss. Well, to me, that's the problem. If I can throw a whopping piece of connective tissue in there, I can look at this patient 20 years from now and I know what it's going to be because the protection's there. So when I can add this dense thick tissue, this connective tissue, it changes everything. And yes, look, it's too short. And when I asked her a little while after, did she want me to crown anything? And she said, I don't care at all. I just want to keep my teeth. And, you know, that's what I hear from everybody. And, and look what's there. You know there's a thick piece of connective tissue. And done. That's going to look that way. What do you think the bacteria are going to do sitting right there? They're going to do nothing. They have a barrier. They got protection. And then I go further, which I'm sure a lot of us do. And I speak, I speak for this group in general. But when I look at a case, I always look at it restoratively. I don't care about perio, because perio is real simple to me. I'll show you how I do perio, it's about basic. But if I have a patient that has, I know I'm gonna have to do osseous to correct the um, craters here, but there's fenestrations on every single tooth. So I'm really gonna sit here and think, what am I gonna do to protect that tooth long-term? And so you can see the fenestrations where they are. I did my, my uh, you know, removal of the defects. And I put in a large piece of alle allograft tissue. And so I feel a little better because at least I'm putting something in that maybe acts like connective tissue and I sew it up. But then those of you that know me, I kind of have this thing I like to do. To me, if I do something, I want to know if it works. So whenever I would put in a piece of allograft, I'd say, I wonder if it worked. And then I also feel certain other things. But what I did was I opened it up six, week six weeks later. That looks to me like dense, thick connective tissue. I didn't do biopsy, so I can't say it, but there's what it was before. How do you think that's going to feel now? What do you think the bacteria have to do? They have to spend a year to try to get through that. That's like a barrier. This is when breakdown can occur again. So basically, I'm talking, and look, look at the depth now of the vestibule here. And that's, you know, that's secondary. But this is a case with Bill Strupp. I, I, you know, for time, I left it out, but he did his cores, his provisionals, like perfect. But what my job was to do was to add connective tissue. And at the time, believe it or not, this is like three different types of tissue. 
alloderm. There's like every time I was learning there. So one's palatal tissue, alloderm. The other thing that you see that, that we all should talk about is periodontals and be very proud of is that we get rid of the call and we create keratinized tissue in approximately. There's no more epithelium there. So once again, we're building a barrier. So there's a lot to periodontal surgery that we really don't ever really talk about. And that is about the building up of the protection long-term to avoid the immune response. So now you have this barrier and there it is now, just looking down, but here's where the patient started. That was their barrier of protection and look where they are now. And what's it gonna take for that to break down? I say, never, it won't. The tissue is different. I've had people say to me, why are you fooling with mother nature? And my simple answer is if it works so well, we wouldn't have implants. So what I try to do is change the causes for a failure. And so when I'm doing a treatment plan, as silly as it sounds, all I say to my restorative guys is, my restorative specialists is, can you do a core for me and not have it contaminated? And if they say yes, I can keep the tooth. If they say no, I can't. For instance, if there is a decay into the frication of a molar, that's, you know, and, and he says to me, I can't do it, it's an extraction. But if he says, I can keep these teeth and you know, if I can build a core, then I should be able to treat it. These are what I found back in the 70s. The one thing I do have is 1975, when we used to take pictures. And we were proud of this, because we were taught at Emory and like everywhere in the 60s and early 70s were that if you put an amalgam in, you never worried about decay again. It's nobody's fault. You don't put blame here because we were all taught that, you know, temporary filling, this, I'm getting ready to do surgery, I, you know, I'm excited. There's nothing right here. So I look at it a couple years later and start to say, what's going on? 1976, as I started to do biologic shaping, I also found out another problem. Under all these amalgams that never had to worry about decay, they all had decay. So I said to Bill Strupp, you know, I got a little problem here. I'm finding out what should we do? And he said, well, let's just take out the amalgam. 1975, we didn't have core buildups. So we would just take it out. This is uh, 2000 and about 10. And this was done by a really good restorative dentist. And I sent him the same letter that I send everybody, take out the old amalgam and you know do core buildup in a provisional. We didn't work that much together. And so I'm doing the case and there's decay here, there's IRM there, I, that's all that. And then I uh, go and do my you know, shape it and there's still decay. And I, I sent him a picture and I call him and I said, hey, you know, I've got a problem there. He says, that can't, you can't be right because I did the amalgam. You know, I just did that amalgam, you know, that's my amalgam. I said, well, look at the pictures. And he ended up taking Bill Strupp's course. He, you know, there was no argument. You know, we weren't great friends, we were friends, but he said, you're right. I said, amalgams need to be taken out. And a lot of us are still just prepping amalgams, but that, and we wonder why things fail. But if you go A, B, C, and D, it just doesn't fail. Now, this is a good friend of mine, and it's just the way it is. He's a paradox. And he says, I don't need cores. He says, I can do everything without it. I, I'm not going to argue with you. He's a very good friend of mine, except he's got amalgams in there. Look how far he had a crown length in these teeth. I wouldn't have had to do that. I would use the core, and I probably would have been somewhere up here because we actually can leave a margin on core. We'll talk about that. But I'm not knocking him. I'm just saying, when you build a tooth back up and you get rid of all the underlying causes such as decay and amalgams, it's hard for it to break down again if you do a really good core. Now, then again, I would discuss this and this would bother me. He sent me, this is these, he's already taken his final impressions and these are getting, being ready to be crowned. He's waiting for the crowns. To me, this is a failure right now because there's no tooth there. These are teepees, as I call them, but they're ready to break down as you look at them. This is you know, his end result. That would bother me. But if there were cores through here, it wouldn't bother me at all because we'd have like natural teeth again. That's just my opinion. Uh, anybody that wants it, although every periodontist has been given on the uh, forum, I've been given everybody an option. About 300 people did take, take them from me, the PDF on how to do a core that Howard Chasler made up. And this is the key. If you do a core, as Peter talked about, 
and you use antimicrobials and you use things that kill everything, Clorox, and we're using each for a different reason. We switch from tubeless said red to tubeless said blue because tubeless said red had fluoride in it and that could inhibit the bond strength. But each one of these has a reason for being used. Smear layer here, you know, so on and save different things. But when I was talking to my friend, the periodontist that does perio restorative, and I asked him what he used for decontamination, he said to me, what do you mean? So then the question would come out, if you don't open up the tubules and you don't get rid of the smear layer, of course the core is gonna fail. But here's the keys, we have antimicrobials and we use them. And I, I use, you've seen this case, but I love it because it says to me this, if we can keep these teeth, you tell me why we can't keep about any tooth we treat. But this is not, this has zero to do with perio. This is a restorative masterpiece. And that's all it is. The periodontist goes along for the ride. My life was based on restorative. I may be a pretty good periodontist, but I work with triple A restorative specialists. So this patient just didn't want implants. She was given the option of implants. She was a wife of an anesthesiologist and, you know, kind of a medical thing. She said, I still want to risk them. And so it's a case that Bill did. And Bill said, can, you know, can you keep the teeth? And unfortunately, we're both kind of um, egomaniacs. I said, of course I can keep the teeth, not even knowing if I could, but I would never say, no, I couldn't. And so he is cleaning them out. Yes, that's the entire pulp chamber. And these are pulp horns. And so we're pretty well down gone. You can see we're not, you know, where we, and then look, this is a perfectly core placed in dry environment. And once you learn this technique, it takes you about maybe, uh, maybe three months. You'll do a core hundred percent of the time because you'll love it. And as a periodontist, I think we'd all agree. What a joke. I, I got to work on this. I just didn't have to screw up. These are incredibly strong teeth now. So I just opened it up. I, I did a very nominal uh, procedure. I did do a ferrule. I did create a ferrule because of the amount of tooth missing. Uh, Bill would argue with you that you didn't even need to do that, but I felt comfortable in doing a ferrule again. What you should take note is there's zero, zero margin on any of these teeth. That means from the bone up, what works there? Floss and a curette. If we leave that margin super gingival, that means everything below can be managed by the patient and hygienist. So anytime you leave a problem for them to take care of, breakdown can occur. So that's just the occlusal. If you look at the size of these teeth, there were nothing there. Number seven, Siltrex cord. People ask me, what about why is it put there for only one reason? To allow the lab to trim the dye. It's not done for any other reason. So the, the margins are super gingival. And so that's a day of impressions, keratinized connective tissue. You can't miss it. Remember what we started with. There's where we were. There's where we are now. There to there, and that's 12 years later. Why won't that last 20 years later? What's the reason it's going to break down? There's no reason for it to break down. We go A, B, C, D, and we don't violate it. When we violate it, it doesn't work. But I can tell you over time, just not violent. Someone said, well, why'd you need the root canals? When you have a pulp chamber sitting there, you have to do a root canal. I've actually had people say, oh, so you do need root canals. There was a pulp chamber. The only two root canals were on the two teeth. That was the pulp horn and none on the lower, none anywhere else. So in my office, this used to be in my office. And what I love best about this is when we started doing cores and before we had digital, this is how I would convey to the patient <clears throat> why a core was so important. I would say to them, do you want this junk and it look like this, or do you want it to look like a brand new tooth? And I would say more than that, I'd explain about what it is, but I'd say, I want to, you know, they, most people aren't very dumb. They go, I want a brand new tooth look. Because I say, that's the key to the whole tooth. Once this is done, we can't go wrong. And this is the material, Denmark core paste, enamel shade, hasn't changed. People ask me, that's what we've used since we've been doing cores. Um, Dave Simmons at uh, LSU, who's incredible, uh, will tell you that still, to, he's an incredible guy with materials, will still tell you that's the best material to use. Okay, so now we're together, we're kind of talking as a team. You gotta give me provisionals. You got, you know, as a restorative dentist, 
uh, one of my friends invited me up to Michigan. He says, I can't get my guys to do cores and provisionals. Would you come up and just talk about that? So here's the problem we have. If we try to find decay underneath the crown, we have no clue where it is. So what would happen, he said, I would crown lathe, and then they yelled to me, that they called me up and said, well, you never got the decay. And, and he'd say, How do, I didn't know where the decay was, that's under the crown. So we can't guess. If we're gonna do crown lathing around old crowns, we're gonna destroy the bones so that the dentist won't complain that he can't you know, do a margin. So we gotta do provisionals. And then I had a friend of mine say, well, I've got, I'm doing it. You know, I've got my guys doing provisionals now. You know? And then he sends me the case. The only problem is he never removed the provisional. So a gorgeous provisional was done, but he didn't take it off. So, you know, there's a whole thing that there's, you know, reverse architecture, but he didn't even take it off. And he, look, he did a good job, but you take it off and you could do a great job. He left the frication here. I would remove that. And that's not knocking him. You know, he's just starting to do it. He's trying to barely, and I would still, you know, create a little more parabolic architecture. But if someone's going to give us a provisional, we got to take it off. And this is why. My entire surgery, as the majority of the periodontists that are on here, is a vertical surgery. You can't do surgery horizontally. It has to be vertically. So I can take and get rid of all this stuff, but imagine if there's a crown here, boom. I can't get rid, I can maybe get rid of 80% of it, who knows. But in about, oh, maybe two minutes, I can get rid of it all. So I just go, I take a bird and go, whoop, 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 you know, do what I got to do. All my restorative dentists, we're all on the same page. We know what we're doing. They know what, you know, I wanted them and so on and so forth. Now, making this short, you know, I couldn't give you everything, but we do the surgery, put the provisionals back on, and then they're going to come back to a restorative dentist in four weeks because the provisionals won't fit real well. And they're going to reline the provisionals. They are not going to touch the tooth at all. There's going to be no preparation of the tooth. And in fact, we're going to leave the margins of the provisionals one millimeter away from the tissue because the biologic width has not decided where it wants to be. And it won't decide for 12 to 14 weeks. So why do I want to guess? Why do I want to, why do I want to interfere with biology? I don't. So I let biology do its thing and I move on. But there is absolutely no prep whatsoever. And this is mandatory one millimeter of space. We cement with Duraline or Tylock, and people say, why do you like the space? You know, there's two reasons. One is to allow the biologic width to grow. Peter will totally understand this. The other is we like to bathe the tooth in chlorhexidine. We like to get the chlorhexidine working on the root surface and we like Trevenin. That's why we don't have sensitive teeth. We don't cover them and hide them. We expose the tubules right away to antimicrobials, and to you know, desensitizing agents, and they calm down. They don't get worse. Because people say, well, when you do biologic shaping, it must re mean a lot of end up. We don't do any end up, unless it was gonna be before. But there's gonna be more to it, and it's gonna be about what type of margins we do. We're gonna cover that. But again, there is no margin on that tooth for 12 to 14 weeks. Then at 14 weeks, we're going to do a chamfer margin, just coronal to the gingival collar. We're not going to do a shoulder. So when everybody talks to me about, well, you know, this is, you're destroying the tooth. and you're, When you do a shoulder, that's more destruction than I'll ever do. So we don't do the things that create problems. We try to get rid of them. And I, I do, I left it out, but I get rid of all CEJs, 100% when I'm doing it. In fact, I'll spend a second here because this is important for restorative dentists to think about. If this is a perio-restorative case, how many times do you think you end a margin on enamel in a perio-restorative case? Never. Because if there's a pocket, we remove the pocket and you're on dent or cementum. So when people tell me about dental bonding, it didn't work. Bill Strupp has kept a very good diary and we had very few failures doing dental bonding for the last 30 years. So we got to think about what we've been doing and why does it really fail? So the only time that I really even check a patient is at five weeks, right? After they went back to have the uh, provisional reline, they then come back to me and 
if I didn't see that patient in five weeks, can you imagine at 12 weeks, the guy would be calling me and said, you just did the worst surgery in the whole world. You're terrible. So that's what I want to see the patient because this is what should be there. Perfect tissue healing, a millimeter space. This has been relined. You can see the difference in the acrylic right there. And that's the space to allow for the, you know, the, the tissue to be growing um, and, and just continue to grow to where it wants to go. Uh, 12 to 14 weeks later, I told you we're going to do a chamfer margin. We're going to keep it super gingival. And you all know, look at the tissue. That also comes from great restorative. Because if the professionals fit well and, and they go through all that, then everybody gets happy. So biologic shaping, you know, maybe I don't, I don't know what that term is. I made it up one day. It's kind of a, just a term. It doesn't mean anything, but it's to get rid of the causes that create periodontal disease, in my opinion. And there's no better photo than this right here. Because if you don't have the patient and the hygienist have the ability to clean the teeth, don't do the surgery. It's going to fail. So I see reasons why we, you know, we get into this thing where it's better to do an implant. And I believe it's better to do an implant if you're just going to, you know, not treat a tooth to get rid of the causes. But you know what we found out too is if the patient and hygienist can't take care of the, the implant, like people thought at one time, it didn't matter. But now we know it, the term is called periimplantitis. And I would far rather treat a tooth than a, an implant with a disease. And so biologic shaping encompasses three aspects. It's not one. When people say to me, oh, it's all about the root. I said, it's nothing to do with the root. It's the soft tissue. It's the bone and the root surfaces. They all three must be treated. So when I'm doing surgery, I look at this and I say, I, this is Howard's case. And I said to Howard, you know, I didn't even see, he sent me the picture. I said, well, what do you want to do? He says, well, I can do cores. I said, no, I can keep the teeth. Because if he can do a core, how can I not keep the tooth? And so we go along. What was nothing there now are these large teeth. I go in there, there's the frication. There's, I have a responsibility to Howard and to the patient, the hygienist. So I go in and I do my work. This is barreled in, that's the core. People say, well, you have a fracture. No, that's the core and that's the old tooth. And say, people said to me, why is that so dark? Did he leave a lot of decay? A lot of young dentists have never seen that. And that's sclerotic dentin. That's all it is, nothing big, nothing bad. And it can be, you know, corrected. But so that's what we've done. We've barreled in the frication. You must be able to see the tissue and bone from the coronal portion. So we went from there to there. Who made the case? The restorative specialist. The restorative pest specialist allowed me the ability to treat the case. Without him, I couldn't have done it. So we go from there to there. How can the case fail now? What's going to cause failure? You can put a margin super gingival. You've got teeth, the size, tremendously large teeth, which physics will tell you, just do physics. The bigger the tooth, the stronger it will be, the more bonding space, the more circumferential. And you can bond this, and it's never coming off. So, you know, we do, by the way, so I get this every time. I will crown lengthen a tooth when I have to. I don't do one thing and say, well, you know, that's not what's needed. I won't do it. This needy crown lengthening. And the short version of this case is simple. This has already been treated surgically. And it was referred to me when I surgically treated again. It was treated surgically by a periodontist, which is okay. That's life. The patient comes to me. I, I, I'm, I'm doing surgery. And this is at the time of my surgery. And the surgery has been completed about six, four months prior. There's still calculus in there. Look at the CEJs. So how is a patient or a hygienist going to clean that? I don't know a tool that can be done. There, you can't have concavities in teeth unless it's a certain area where we can get with a toothbrush. But so what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on the line angles, not the concavity, but the line angles to make it so what works now? Floss and a curette. I just solved the problem. Never did anything really periodontally more than to the tooth, because that's where most of this was required. So we went from a non, in my opinion, a non-maintainable area. You could not have cleansed that area to an area now that's totally cleansable by floss. 
And so as I was going along in this case, I started looking as a restorative periodontist, this was very troubling to me because here's the end of the tooth and here's the core. So I'm looking at this case and I'm saying to myself, I've got to now worry about what? I got to worry about the feral effect because this, this is not going to cut it. If this was going out here, I'd feel totally different. So I go ahead and I, uh, I'm laying it back now. Again, you have to appreciate this has surgically been treated. There's a large excess tosis of satori. Never touched the bone. Never really touched anything. But that's the point. But my, my thing is, I went ahead and I re removed the bone, but I crown lengthened to create a ferrule because I was very uncomfortable with the lack of tooth surface present. So I wanted the margin to be on sound tooth structure. I only do a ferrule if there's endo or if I, I don't know the, the dentist I'm working with, which doesn't happen anymore. But the bottom line is, if this was out here, I would, if there would have been a monster core, I would not have removed bone. Maybe just a little bit. I would have removed the excess tosis for sure. There's your ferrule. I don't believe in ferrules. Um, um, there's a lot of great articles to say they're not needed. Had this come out here, it would have been a whole different game, but that's life. It's not that terrible of a thing. But you can see where we were. And if I, and that's where you are now, I got rid of it. But he, if you were to come out here, all the way out there, I wouldn't have done all that shaping like I did. Day of final impressions, this was how it was going to be. Never touch the frication. There's the frication there. There's the frication there. And then there's decay there. So all in all, when you say perio restorative doesn't work, I kind of can understand that. You're right. If you don't do anything, it's not going to work. So we went ahead, and, and this was not, not, not very hard to do. There is your, you know, deep. It's a little narrow frication, so it's a little harder, but it actually is easier. So I worked on the line angles. I worked on the line angles. That's all I did. I did most of my work. I corrected any osseous to create a parabolic architecture, but that's maintainable now. And all the periodontists know, and I wish that the end of the two-day surgical course would go into heaven and never come back. Because when I hear about pain, I know that almost all periodontists would agree with me here that when you know how to lay a flap and close a flap and you're gentle and you get primary closure, there's not a whole lot of discomfort. And when I hear general dentists say, well, I tried it. And my patient was really, oh, that was terrible. I'm thinking, why did you try it to begin with? And that's one of the things we've got to learn to stay within our realm. What we know to do great, let's do great. Okay. Here's to me one of the biggest things. There's three parts, all parts are you know equal, but if you look at a lot of cases and you go like this case was done by Bill Strop and the patient wasn't brushing her teeth. And when I opened up, she had two developmental grooves and there's bonding material. Bill can't go under tissue just like anyone else. There's bonding material. Bonding material is going to set up the inflammatory response and we're going to go from there. But there's a developmental grooves. It's open there. It can't be shut. And usually what's there is bonding material. So what I'm going to do is just decimate it. Oh, sorry, I left it out. But I, I removed the developmental grooves. I'm showing here. But this young patient was referred to me, believe it or not, to have the, she was going to have this tooth extracted and an implant placed. She was best friends with my daughter. And my, daughter's, my daughter called me and said, would you see Maria? She's supposed to have this tooth taken out, but she would like you to look at it. And I said, well, why were they going to take it out? She says, well, because I've got, my gums are going up higher and they're worried if it keeps going, I'm going to have a very ugly result with an implant. And so... I looked at it, you know, I didn't really see a problem. And that's, you know, we're not going to get into implants or not. But when I opened it up, there was a tremendous developmental groove running up the length of the tooth. So the question would be, do we put Geristory in there? What do we do? You know what I do? I just get rid of it. I don't really care. I got rid of the enamel too. I don't really care. Because if I can create an environment that can stay maintainable long term, then the problem is not coming back. Now, remember what we discussed. Am I gonna just rely on that little piece of connective tissue? No, and that's the burr I used. But there's a piece of palatal tissue going in. 
because I'm going to do A, B, C, D. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to do connect soft tissue. I'm going to do bone and I'm going to do uh, root surfaces in there. It might, you know, it goes back, it's covered back up. And that's how she looked at about a year later. And then 40, as I was doing this, I said, wouldn't it be neat to get, you know, I was kind of scared to be honest with you. But I said to my daughter, can you call Maria and get her to take an iPhone picture now? And so here it is 14 years later. And she's the happiest person in the world, obviously, because it's not an implant. But notice what the tissue did. It continued to grow coronally. And I always say to them, do you want me to change? They, they, they say, don't touch it because I have it, <laughs> you know, because it started that you thought she was going to have an implant. And so there it is 14 years later. If, in my opinion, don't violate biology and you also build biology that stronger, doesn't want to break down. So she went from all different problems to no problem. She's stronger now than she was before and never broke down. And so where biologic shaping to me can play a, a fairly large part is, again, can't go anywhere without a great restorative dentist. And I do think what we're coming back to, if I was a restorative dentist, that was not a big deal relying heavily on implants, which is life. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but my patients may not have the money right now. I would simply learn to do cores and before you know it, you're going to say to my, yourself, it's kind of hard to lose a tooth. So Bill did what he had to do, puts in these monster cores. And I can tell you that they're not hard to do. It takes you maybe five or six times, and then you feel good about it. And then when you see monsters, but from a paradox standpoint, and I always like to use literature, you know, whatever, because we all know you got to go by literature. If you've read Burton Langer, we all know that when you have a margin about approximating the bone and you've got some bone loss, you've got to do crown lengthening. And we all dread interproximal crown lengthening because we know we've got to take three millimeters of bone away there, which means three or four or five millimeters of bone away on the bicuspid and even more on, in words, you just ruined the teeth. Let's do an implant. So I always go back and you can see the same thing on the mesial and say to myself, well, what's the problem? The problem is the margin. And all I did was remove the margins. And I created space for the biologic width without destroying the bone. Didn't even have to touch the bicuspid, just did parabolic architecture. I always want to do that. But I always want to create a space. And if where we are today is frankly, I don't even care if you finished on the core because I know how great they are. But the, the bottom line is I didn't crown lengthen. Because I really, yeah, I did shape the bone to create a parabolic architecture, but look at the space now, there was none. So when you look at the case, this is kind of like where biologic shaping is kind of really wonderful because you don't destroy the bone. You don't make te teeth weaker. And fortunately, look at the amount of connective tissue there. So all I had to do is place the tissue where I always do, which is just coronal to the bone. And that's going to be fair, fairly minimal discomfort. So that would be how we would handle root surfaces. And now we're going to get to a, um, the bicuspids. If you talk about a mesial lingual of an upper molar or the distal lingual of upper molar frication, they're all treated identical to a mesial, mesial concavity of a bicuspid. You never, ever keep accentuating the concavity. You work on the line angles. So what's going to work? If you work out here, you don't work in there. You don't make it worse. Oh, let me back up. I think I can go back. What works? That's in a way. Floss. You have a convex area now. Floss works. What works? Curette. Everything that I do when I'm done, I say, can the patient and hygienist clean it? Because if they can't clean it, why did I do it? It's as simple as that. And so we're going to come you know, actually look at a bicuspid. And, you know, I, I speak to graduate students. And uh, the first thing they always say to me is, what type of bone regeneration did you did, do there? And the fact is, I would bet anybody in the world they couldn't regenerate that because it's very hard to regenerate to concavities. You know, we always think right now in 2019 and 18, everything's fancy stuff. It's got to be fancier. It's not as good as what we used to do. And I, I kind of believe... Nothing supersedes biology. If you always go back to biology and just follow the basics, almost all the cases are going to work if you don't screw up. 
when I screw up. They don't. But I've got a concavity. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to work on the line angles. And I'm not going to try to fill this in. I'll just I'll reshape it. I'm not, there's no way I'm going to get bone regeneration here. And I'm going to use a coarse diamond, not that anybody cares. And then a super fine diamond. But where am I working? Only on the line angles. I don't want to sit there and accentuate the concavity. And then I'm taking a diamond round burr. There's my periosteum from the periosteum. 100% of the time, I suture to periosteum. So my flap never moves. And I can put it anywhere I want Sutured, because I had to do some osseous more, my sutures are up high, but they're in periosteum, and there's no more concavity. It's gone. It's flat. They have impressions. Uh, uh, 13 teeth, 360 degrees on every single tooth. You know, and then we would go from there to there. Super gingival margins. When we get to molars, I got to be honest with you, I don't know of anything easier to treat than molars. Everybody else goes, I, I've heard things that make me want to almost cry. I've had a graduate student tell me with a class one frication that it should be taken out immediately. That way they'll be boned for the implant. And a frication is just the easiest thing to treat. Look at the tissue and you can just look. Tissue loves negative contours. And the tissue in a frication area, I treat this like bicuspid. There's a bicuspid here and a bicuspid there. So I, and in the old days, well, and we stole this from uh, Wilson and um, Maynard and everybody, they were legends of their time, Maynard, Gary Maynard. Um, uh, Chris Richardson uh, went into practice with Gary, but they were writing about this in the 60s. I've had people say to us when Bill and I would lecture, oh, that's unbelievable. I said, yeah, it was done in, in the 60s. The reason they did it in the 60s is they didn't have the fancy materials we do, we do today. So they knew that with a metal collar and, and strut, it could be like three tenths of a millimeter. These guys were way ahead of their time. They were talking about chamfers in the 60s. And that's Gary Maynard and uh, Wilson. So the bottom line is we just took it from them. We didn't invent this. Nothing we invented, we just used. But this is very important. And I, and I use this because I think all hygienists should be trained this way. And that is when you're doing your exams and the hygienists are in there, they should, oh, well, we all should do it. But where is that previous margin? Because when I do my exam, that's very important to me. If the margin is subgingival on a molar, there's research, and I'll show it to you, that shows in all likelihood the next margin is going to be in the frication. As I showed you when we were talking about probing, with one millimeter probings, the, margin would, the next margin would be in the frication. So what you want to do is start getting yourself attuned to this and knowing that either you take two years of surgery or you develop a great relationship with a restorative dentist, I mean, a periodontist, and let them just do it right for you. That's one of my two choices. I, I prefer just getting a good periodontist. But the bottom line is, if you're subgingival, you can't go ahead and stay out of the frication. It's impossible. So here's a margin supergingival. The margin is the roof of the frication. I went up under there and I was just pulling out what was left of the cement. What loves cement more than anything? Bacteria. What do bacteria do when they, when they ingest cement? They release endotoxins. What do endotoxins do? They destroy bone. This is all biology, microbiology. It's like everything that I didn't like in graduate school is what made me a decent paradox. It's all following biology. So here it is. And so my friends know what I did here. I just got rid of it. I got rid of it till there was no more frication. I could go straight up. And you see, you see the cement there. You could go all the way up under here. There was nothing there. I'm real comfortable. I've done enough of these now, you know, see them last. So it just goes up and that's it. But the point to you is that margin was super gingival. It was non-restorable. So when we stop the probe horizontally, we can get in a lot of trouble. And here's the journal, Journal of Perio 2003. It just basically says one thing. On lower molars, if you're under the tissue, you're going to be in the frication on your next margination. That's all it says. Uh, so you know this. Uh, well, well, I'll go over it. How do I remove a frication? How do I know when it's gone? You'll see this every time. The roof of the frication is the old margin. So there's the bone. Pretty good, though. We got good bone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a parabolic architecture, which is pretty easy. 
but I'm gonna take my probe at the bone and I'm gonna go straight up and if it doesn't catch, the frication's gone. If it catches anywhere, there's still a frication. So that's how I do it. And there's 360 degrees, there's zero margin left. For those that are looking at this uh, fracture, it doesn't even go to the bone, so it's irrelevant. People said to me, what about the fracture? The bone is there, so it didn't even matter. And that's the finished case. Super gingival margins, PFMs, barrel to the occlusal surface. Uh, that's about 20 years old. Look at the amount of connective tissue. I'm telling you, if I violate it, I think I've got it right there. It fails every time. But so which would you rather be doing? Or which would you be able to look at a patient and say, this or this? Which do you think is going to last 20 years? A tooth that's huge or a bunch of TPs? That looks like, you know, I hope the bonding's incredible. I don't blame anybody. This isn't a blame game. This is for us to think about, huh, maybe this core is something because not enough of us are doing it. And it's once you do it by way, you charge a fee for it. Of course you do. It's not free. But I would give this to most periodontists and I would say to them, so treat that for me. There it is, cut right in half, the frication cut right in half. There is no crown lengthening. You can't crown lengthen the molar. It's impossible because the frication bone always moves coronally when we move in. So what are we gonna do? Take the tooth out and do an implant? And there it is, the frication is separated by the, the margin. And so there it is, and what I did is what I always do. I play dumb. I try never to think, I try to use the simplest things I can do, which is get rid of the old margin. And so I got rid of the old margin, the problem is solved I always create a parabolic architecture if I can. I mean, I try, I say always, I make mistakes, but never touch the bone other than to create a parabolic architecture. It got rid of the entire margin, which means what? It's gonna grow back wherever I want. By the way, I can't say anything. This, this guy used to be an F dentist. I've shown his last three cases were his, but this was an F dentist. That's an A plus dentist. So when I hear those have heard me lecture, I use his name because this guy was the worst dentist I've ever seen. And now is one of the best guys I've ever seen. So when I hear people say, ah, I don't know if you can do it, you can do it. Now, the short story on this is this, this tooth was to be extracted. This patient was to have implants. I do not argue with that at all. She was 33 years old. She was from East Germany and she called Howard and said, Howard, she already had all ready to go. Next week was implant. She goes, I want to have babies. You know, she married a rich cardiologist says, I, I, I don't want implants. And so Howard said, well, we kind of got it rich. She says, I don't want implants. What else are you going to do? Uh, she said, in fact, her husband got on. She says, keep her with whatever she does now to get through the children, and I'll redo everything with implants. He says, don't worry about the money. So Howard said, okay. So three aspects. Remember, bone, soft tissue, and root surfaces. Well, we've got the frication. By the way, I'm sorry I left the x-rays out, but they're really uh, non-specific. I couldn't even wiggle the tooth. It was like a, a zero mobility. So when I was talking to them, when I finally met her and she came in, I was kind of giggling, to be honest with you. I was giggling because I'm going, how can I lose this tooth? Not how can I keep it? How could I lose it? So I got the ability to make it so what? The hygienist and the patient could clean it. I added the connective tissue. I got rid of 360 degrees. There was no real core or anything. I put it back, by the way, there's all me. And, and also in the real world, as a periodontist will tell you, we don't get these cases where there's a three millimeters of recession and five millimeters of connective tissue and anything's gonna work. We get patients with mucosa where we actually have to come up with a way to get rid of it. We can't just do certain things. Like when they say, well, I always just do this or I always do that. Well, guess what? You can't do it in these cases. So basically, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna have add the tissue. There's the graft popped right through because I left the epithelium on it. Howard did a telescopic bridge, perfectly done, and that's about 13 years now. He just, I, you know, I have him, I didn't put him in here because of time, but that's 13 years later, the actual picture. But the bottom line is, it's not there. It, it will be there 25 years later. But 10, 10 years, it's 13 now. And what's missing? 
no endo. That's taken, you know, for the case. I try to leave stuff out, but there's no endo. 13 years later. So when people tell me about endo, it's only because they don't understand. And so people constantly say to me, and I say to people, why would you want to mistake, do a mistake that I already made? I made these mistakes. This, this dentist did not bury to the occlusal surface like I asked him to, and a, the tissue grew back, because what does it look like, a frication? Same thing on the other side. <clears throat> you know what's interesting here? I did surgery on these cases. It didn't work at all when the restorative wasn't, wasn't right, and it never fails when the restorative's right. So I can give you a guideline if you want to follow how never to have a problem because I've made all the mistakes. And every time this was done wrong, the tissue looked terrible. And every time they did it right, the tissue looked great. Case said, Howard sent to me and said to me, huh, and this had been surgery done already. And he said, well, how come that grew back? And I said, it's real simple. The frication's still there. In other words, when I pulled that out, I redid it. I could go right up under here and I'd get all of his bonding. And some, you know, all his, everything underneath was there because that's just the blood filling in the frication. It happens. And the material that we use today for the restorative guys, the materials we had in the 70s, 80s, and 90s never were like they are today. We have a material called Lissy Press. It's Emacs. It's, a, it's the you know, next generation Emacs. But what is so great about Lissy Press is, and watch this. Forget that. I don't care about that. This is what I care about. Three-tenths of a millimeter chamfer. So that means you don't have to sit there and do a shoulder. You know, we go through zirconia and guys go, well, I do a shoulder on zirconia. We don't use zirconia, so I can't say wrong or right. But the thing about this is I know they can do a chamfer margin, which just preserved at least a half a millimeter, if not more, of tooth structure. So we're not insulting the tooth again. If I biologically shaped and then they did a chamfer, they're barely touching the tooth. And this can be bonded in. We know this can be etched and bonded, and in reality, theoretically, or whatever, and the argument goes, zirconia should be cemented in and not bonded in, but I'm not going to, you know, we won't argue there. So why can't we crown lengthen a tooth? And the reason being is very simple. You can see the margin here. So let's say you said, well, crown lengthen, I've got to use that margin. Well, I've got to remove the bone three millimeters in the frication. Here's the problem. The bone always moves coronally. So I never create a space. There's no biologic width. I always keep going and I keep to, or if I really get silly, I start taking bone away here and the furcation just keeps going and I've lost the tooth. Or you get rid of the old margin and the bone is sitting there coronal like it always is. Look at the size of that tooth. Felspathic porcelain, that's what we used back in those days. We didn't have um, Lissy Press, super gingival margins, yard of connective tissue, barreled in perfectly. We take our impressions at 12 to 14 weeks. Uh, Howard and I b believe Bill are on the same page, 3M imprint with a four pink light and blue heavy. That's exactly what they use. And I kind of just say, if I was a restorative dentist, I'd follow what these two guys do because They've done it all wrong. The beauty about Bill Strupp is he'll tell you that whatever he uses now is based on a hundred mistakes. It's not saying oh, I did everything perfect. He goes, this is what works for me. So the good news, we're about there and I'm gonna take you through this case. And let's see if we, we can all agree that this is a very simple case if we don't violate biology. That was a case I was showing you before. Remember, that's just a, a green cord, it's in there. The patient was gonna do only one crown. He was 74 years old and I talked him into doing the whole arch. And it wasn't that I talked him into it, it was the right thing to do because all his teeth, he didn't just get lucky to have one tooth rotted away. I said, you're gonna have all of them rotted away and I don't wanna see you back yearly for surgery. But it's like you saw, so Howard then went in, you can see he had already done that one. And then he came to me and I said, I, it would be silly for me to do it that way. He says, all right, take them off. And so, you know, Howard's doing his thing. And that's before. Look what's going on. So we were a winner, by the way. 
were a winner because as soon as the guy saw that, he knew we weren't fibbing. But more importantly, he started sending his friends to us because he says, these guys really, they really know how to do it right. I was going to have my teeth all rotted away and they wouldn't let me. But so, he, you know, there's what he's, he's done. Frankly, I would have liked to see the cores to come out all the way out to the edge. But, you know, a core is a core. I'm really tickled pink with them. And so here we go. How would we treat this case surgically? Is there a legitimate way surgically to treat it where the, now that you see the tissue reflected back, I'm right. There's the margin separating the frication. So how do you treat that surgically? How do you treat it restoratively? You can't. So where it may be a hopeless tooth in some instances, for me, what did I do? I just simply shaped the tooth and look where the bone, look how far the bone, there was no way to crown lengthen this. The bone's all the way up here near the core. Now, another nice thing about periodontists that I, that I love about periodontists is we understand biology. And the biologic width is a range of zero to five. I can tell you most biologic widths on a molar are maybe one. And I never worry about it. You can barely see. Now watch how this is. There's the core and there's the bone. So where's my three millimeters? There's a day of impressions. He's got, I'm sorry, I hope you can see right there, but he's got the tissue and he's got his margin super gingival. So we go along, there's the impression, you know, done. There's a final crown and you all, I think, have all have seen this, but that's a year after it was done. The patient's 75 now. Metal struts, cosmetics was not an issue. Meticulous, restorative. I mean, it is so pristine, it's unbelievable, okay? And then I hear this all the time too, you know, about when I get with European guys and we talk on Facebook, they're very big that if people can't take care of their teeth, you should take the teeth out. I don't mean that as a negative, but they say, well, if they can't clean them, get them out. And so what I found is that if you did everything right, the patient doesn't have to take care of their teeth. This guy's 84 year now and he's got some dementia. So the bottom line is his teeth aren't really clean. Where's the breakdown? The reason there's no breakdown is because he's got a yard of connective tissue. He's got perfect crowns that fit. The hygienist can clean him regularly. And if he doesn't do the best job, we're still okay. And that's 10 years later. And he doesn't take care of his mouth. We don't care. Just come in. Restorative was absolutely, look, this is, see how clean he is in a year? Look at him now. He doesn't really brush his teeth. Does anybody see any breakdown? 84 years old because a restorative is pristine. Okay, 10 years later, anybody see any endo? Because I always get asked these questions, where's the endo? And now we're down really to the end. And so my problem is I don't know how to lose teeth. Because this patient I treated on the left, he was from California, he had a, came in with an abscess, it was very easy to treat, I just barreled in a frication, everything was great. Bill called me up. He said, uh, the, my, he used to wear a cowboy. He said, my cowboy's back in town. It was about five years later. And he said, he's got an abscess on the right. He says, we're going to do an implant. So he comes from California. So he came in. He had a big abscess. I said, um, you're right. You have an abscess because he just want, Bill wanted to confirm. And I said, um, so you can go through an implant. He says, nah, I ain't going to do it here. You know, he goes, I'm, I'll go back to California and have it done. I said, so Bill's not going to do it. He says, no. I said, well, would you mind if I kept the tooth? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I can keep the tooth. You probably get at least five, maybe 10 years out of it because the only place it's gonna affect anything is itself. It's not gonna damage the other teeth. You know, the way we do implants, it's not gonna really hurt that. So he said, all right. And he was there. I said, let's do it today because then you don't even have to come back. You know, he was in town for like a week. I said, come in, let me do it. So I opened it up and he had <clears throat> a class three frication had a frication problem here, but the, the biggest thing I learned about these as I started doing was the water you can make it, the better it would be. So I just did what I had to do and I made sure a proxy brush would go through the buckle and go through the lingual because then it could put fluoride on it. I did barrel it in. You see, I barreled it in because I at least wanted to get it closer and easier from the clean. I hate how to contours because it, make it makes it harder to clean. So my suture is running through the frication. That means I have a space for the proxy brush. 
and we put fluoride on the proxy brush. There it is, buckling lingual, and he never lost a tooth. Still there. Both teeth, never changed. Nothing. So I show you this picture for one great reason, and that is you can do all the biologic shaping in the world. I don't see any need for crowns. I don't see any need for this is a virgin tooth. I barreled it in. Now, I don't correct a lot of things in approximately. And, you know, the question that was asked to me, I never do biologic shaping on teeth to remove like a CEJ. If they're healthy, I don't treat them. So there's problems that are wrong. And But my point is, here's an onlay, and we barreled it in. And the very last slide is critical. This is Bill Strupp's case. The finest, one of the finest dentists in the world, restorative specialist. He left the margin super gingerly. He was showing this to a group. Look at the bonding material. If that was subgingival, Bill Strupp would have been like anybody else. Now, you know, I kind of mentioned to him, maybe you want to get that off before the next time you show it. But my point being is, I've just given you all the reasons to have avoid cases from failing. And they're connective tissue, they're, you know, perfect crowns, but super gingival margins solve 90% of your problems. And that's it. Oh, you want me to get off here? Stop sharing. No, I want to share. I still want to share. Or I, what do I want to do there? No, I think I think I can take care of it, Danny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can stop you. Oh, look at that. Oh, we got some questions. This is fantastic, Danny. Oh, look at my hair. Ha 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 ha. All right, we got some nine nine questions. You ready? Yeah. All right, dear Dr. Melker, could you please explain what did you mean by saying? that for the 17 year old, you could not do crown lengthening because you will destroy the bicuspid. How would you destroy it? Okay. The old margin that was present on the crown was subgingival touching the bone. In fact, it cr created a crater. So for all of us to do crown lengthening, we know we have to take three millimeters of bone away in approximately to create a space for the biologic width. You, and this is the, Biggest misconception by dentists, not periodontists, but by regular dentists. Crown lengthening usually involves three teeth. The tooth that needs to be crown lengthened and then the adjacent teeth, because you can't just take away three millimeters of bone on the molar, you'll create a vertical defect. So you have to take the bone away on the bicuspid too, thus taking away you know three or four millimeters off the buccal plate of bone which is destroying the tooth, literally making it mobile possibly in a 17-year-old in patient. So the alternative to that is just to remove the margin, which is the cause of the problem. That is, I answer that, I hope. Yep, that works for me. Um, Danny, I've followed your beautiful work for years. You definitely have disciples out here, but we need help figuring out your suturing technique. Awesome work. Um, I have no suturing technique. My technique is simply that the flap must go down and it must be down on bone everywhere and it must not move. And that's the te technique really is suturing the periosteum so the flap cannot move. And then if you saw someone look like they had five yards of suture, I just go back and forth until it lays down. I mean, that's really the way I do it. I mean, I do a continuous suture. I'll go, all right, if anybody wants it, let them send you. I have a uh, PowerPoint on continuous suturing. All right, I'll tell you what, I'm going to, because there's some questions about this, and we're going to put everything on directorofdentistry.com slash learn. So just put your name up there. I'm going to get, I'm going to get everything, the recordings, uh, as well as Danny's stuff. We're going to put it all up there so everybody will have access to it, okay? I will send you the PowerPoint continuous suture. And Thank you, Danny. Go step by step. Now, there's one thing, Danny, that I want to emphasize, and that is that you split every flap. That's how you. Well, okay, okay, that is ninety-eight percent correct. Ninety-eight percent. Okay. Well, if there's an exostosis or or a tori, I'm going to do a full thickness flap over that. You are correct. I will always split, but it may be up in the vestibule to where that's where I remember I showed you the suturing way up high. You know, up in the vestibule, I showed that case where I removed the bone on the patient that already had surgery, yep. and I couldn't split it for about seven millimeters. So I do a full thickness. That's why I always feel the bone to begin with. Know where I, so I don't do a, a split and split the, uh, and perforate the whole flap. So I may do full for seven millimeters 
and then split the last three millimeters so that I can in fact suture two. So you are, you know, that's why I say 98, maybe 100. Thanks. I, I split, tried, tried to. Um, Dr. Melker, would you be willing to share the PDF about placing cores you spoke of? So is that something we you'll also be able to provide? Every, every periodontist, there's over 300 periodontists that already have it. Every, anybody that wants that is welcome to it. I've offered that to everybody for the last five to seven years. Anybody that wants it is welcome to have it. It's, a, it's, it's not believable. It actually tells how many seconds each um, medication has to be used in color pictures. I mean, it's like 12 seconds for, you know, this. Chlorhexidine scrubs six times, 20 seconds each. I mean, you know, it's perfectly right. done. Yeah. yeah. So yes. that'll also go up, up on directorofdentistry.com slash learn. We'll have that up there for you too. Um, three questions. Number one, some patients always want em their embrasures closed completely, even the posteriors, although it's more self-cleaning. How do you usually explain it to the patient so the patient will accept the treatment you're doing? I, I would, I, it's a hard question to answer because I'd have to know the patient. If I feel that I've got a close relate, it, it really, some people are just they're not going to listen to you no, no matter what you say. Some, once you start talking with them about keeping the teeth long-term and why, they go, okay, that's what it's got to be. It's got to be. But I can tell you this. When you do these surgeries, if you looked at most of my 20-year follow-ups, and I don't show a lot here, there are no embrasure spaces. They fill right in. Because the tissue, want, we, by shaping a tooth, and if you looked at the way the crowns are, they're almost negative a little bit, and the tissue will grow right up that. Tissue doesn't like uh, contours like uh, concavities. They love straight up or, or reverse. And uh, very few of them, I've never heard a patient complain about that. Or at least maybe I didn't listen to them. They were complaining and I didn't listen. <laughs> I think what, they, what do you do to desensitize the patient during post-healing? Okay, we use Prevident. I, can, I, I will tell you what I will do too. I will give a, I have a 14-day or five-week Everything that we do for five weeks with sensitivity, and I'll give you that, and it's step by step. And the bottom line is, the patients never, ever get packed. I've never placed a pack, because to me, that just traps bacteria. I want my patients on fluoride and chlorhexidine. We use 0.2% chlorhexidine, we make ourselves, and then we can use a 4% when we need it. But for the first four weeks, I want them being bombarded with the chlorhexidine and fluoride. So the tubules are closing, they're not staying open, and that's how the sensitivity goes away. It's the reverse. You pack them and you don't, you know, you let the tubules stay open, people come back and are yelling, you take that pack off the first day, they go, oh, it's terrible. I, I found the opposite. But I'll, I'll give you that too, three things I know you need. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, this is on my mandibular posterior distal technique, okay, so the mandibular Posterior distal wedge, you usually use a triangular wedge. Do you aim towards the distal buckle of the second molar, or do you usually go straight horizontal? If so, do you worry about any anatomical limitations such as the lingual nerve? You know, I, I'm going to do this, and I hope everybody appreciate it. I'm not going to discuss surgery that time because, because it doesn't mean what I say. You have to, I can have a tooth tilted lingually, then I have to change everything. I can have all mucosa back there, like we see all the time. And I'm going to do a totally different surgery, you know. So if I say one thing, it may only address one way of doing it. Does that, you know, make sense? It's, yeah, it does. It does. you got to go by, I have to look at it, you know, and look at it. But I, the lingual nerve, you know, I can definitely say one thing about that. You just have to watch out your scalpel isn't sitting off the bone on the lingual. And if it does and you're dropping more than, you know, X number of millimeters, you may have a problem. I've never known that to ever be an issue. But I always try to keep my scalpel hitting bone and never just out in the free world. Good. Another one on suturing technique, but it, but this was, do you have any references or are there any textbooks that you follow that might be good to talk about suturing technique? Um, you know, again, I, I find that hard to answer. I will give you my continuous, continuing as, continuous suturing technique PDF, but I, I you know, it's, I don't have a technique. My technique is when the flap lays on the bone and, it, and it's, that way it's gonna get 100% blood supply. And in a week, I'm the exact opposite. 
of most everybody because everybody always talks. I, it's one young lady was telling me about, well, she worries about all the little hematomas that I'm causing with my suture material. And I say, well, look at it a week. And you can't know the flap was, you know, one thing about wound healing that the periodontists understand this, you want the base to be really wide and you want the top to be narrow. You know, there's all sorts of reasons why some tissue just looks great in a week and other looks like it was mutilated. And I just follow strict wound healing. And, I, and then my suturing is done based on wound healing. Whatever it takes for the tissue to lay down on bone and be immovable is when I'm done. Thank you. Uh, what burrs do you use for biologic shaping? Um, I will give you that. I, I mean, it's, I, you know, coarse, <laughs> a coarse super fine or fat, super, you know, I will send you the burrs. You can get them at Sullivan Shine, uh, Comet and Axis. They're just standard burrs. And I'll give you the name, the, the actual names for each one. That's terrific. Uh, question, is this being recorded? This is great information. Would love to review it again later. Again, go to directorofdentistry.com slash learn. It's going to be there. Uh, most of the cases I have done by removing the frication ended up with severe sensitivity. Did you get the same complication? What did you do about it? Never had that complication. Okay. I, I would you know why would, somebody would get severe sensitivity. Can you? Yeah. If, if they just, if did they, I'd have to say again, why it's not fair to talk is because if I saw the tooth they were talking about, I could tell them. Yeah. Number one, did they use fluorides and chlorhexidine right after surgery? Did they, you know, was the tooth treated, it was barreled in, you know, a certain way? Was it a class two? Was a core placed? Or was it done on a tooth that had decay? You know, there's like 10 reasons they may get sensitivity that we don't. But we've, we've learned through all these years, we use Duralon. You know why we use Duralon as a, as a temporary cement? Because it's antimicrobial. Yes. And so it's got zinc oxide. Every single step is a reason for it. So if a guy uses tampon and a provisional falls off and then, you know, he puts it back on and you as a periodontist get the patient and you're treating them and all the teeth are hot because they're being bathed in bacteria. So there's like A, B, C, D. I don't violate it, nor do my restorative guys. So that's my, my answer. And I'd have to see the two. And I'd be happy if that person wanted to send it to me, was willing to realize we're not in the argument. We're not in a, he's better than whatever. I could probably tell him why. And Danny does that. So uh, I just sent it to him. Um, I sent, when I first started, I was sending stuff to him. Uh, and he didn't call me names. Yeah. Um, what sutures are you using uh, in all of your surgeries? 100% or 99.9% .9 of the time for 40 years, I use 5.0 plain gut suture or 6.0. I never, ever used any non-resorbable suture. I never had one problem with a flap coming undone. And it's all I'm going back to, again, taking your time, making sure you get the, the, the needle to go through in the right area. But uh, my partner, Bob, would verify this. He's in the cases that we use the most basic stuff. I, I never use one non-resorbable suture because I didn't know who was going to take them out. I wasn't doing it. And I couldn't rely on my girls. If they left one, it would be my fault. So everything was re uh, absorbable sutures. 5-0, plain gut. And I got a question stuff. for you you're going to love. Yeah. Why do you think biologic shaping has been basically completely ignored as a technique in all period programs? Because I did it. <laughs> With my stunning personality, I think it, um, well, I will tell you this, it's in several textbooks. You can look at the advanced, um, uh, advanced perio surgery, uh, whatever, uh, what I it's uh, advancements in periodontal surgery. And there's a chapter devoted to exactly biologic shaping. There are two textbooks coming out this year, which will be delayed because of the coronavirus that will have biologic shaping in both of those. So that's three textbooks and it's so, it's not really that overlooked anymore. That's good. Um, I don't know if this is a different subject, it's up to you as to whether you wanna talk about it, as far as what you do in uh, anterior resorption cases, is that something you wanna discuss or it's a different I'd have to, again, I think it's a great question, but you kind of have to, there is no one fix for all and I'd have to see it because some we may be able to get to, we may be able to clean out. The, the endodontist may be able to do it from inside out. You know, there's all sorts of ways, but it depends where it is. Or it may be an extraction and implant. I mean, there's a point which you say, I'm destroying everything to show that I'm better than, you know, why? So the tooth comes out. So, I'd, you know, it depends on where the resorption is. Thank you. Um, question as to why you're waiting for 12 weeks rather than four to six weeks. 
for healing before you make your final decision or final you restoration. Do, you have to do the, you have to understand the biologic whiff. And I will tell you, if you could look at your cases five years later, not one year later, wait five years in those cases where you did it six weeks, unless you left the margins two millimeters high, you're gonna have some tissue one place. No, we let the body, here's the biggest point I can say. I never tell the body what to do. I never say, oh, well, you gotta do it my way. No, I'm gonna do the body's way. And it takes that long for the biologic width to heal. At five to six weeks, you're guessing. And I don't guess. And I'm not bright enough to know what the bile, you know, I have people show and say to me, well, three millimeters, you can do this. I, because this is a short thing, I can show you pictures where the biologic width is 50 different things in a week. And another 50 in three weeks, you know, so just let it alone. Good. Um, question is, because there's uh, variations of biologic width, according to studies, uh, do you always plan for three millimeters or will it vary based on thin tissue, thick tissue? Um, Great question. Great question. And what I think you, that's the beauty of waiting 12 to 14 weeks. That's the beauty of trusting your restorative dentist that if you have to marginate on a core, you can. See, all that's based on the lack of confidence on the restorative dentist. A lot of times we take way too much bone away. Like if my restorative dentist do a core and I see, and I, we get all done and there's, they have to marginate in one area on the core, I could care less. That's the tooth because the core is bonded to the tooth. It's actually better to bond a crown to the core than it is the tooth. It's stronger. So I don't worry. Pascual Magnez, I tell everybody biomimetics. All you have to do is read biomimetics. They've been doing it. I mean, we, we don't agree on everything, but biomimetics, that's all it is. They, they do their final restorations on the core. So, you know, a great core done with non-contamination is, is, to me, it's just a tooth. Yep. Um, it, th this essentially is a comment, but I'm, I'm going to ask it as a question. Um, how do you educate your GPs? And I can, let me answer first. I educate my GPs by taking my GPs to your course. Uh, and uh, of course, now that I'm in semi-retirement, I've sent my general dentist and my periodontist to your course together. I mean, that, that's to me how it's done. You well, I, I think it's a, that's, yes, I, I, I don't want to go there on that. I don't like to talk about courses, but yeah. I think it's just a matter of if you, here's the old thing too, if you really believe in it, and you sit with your, particularly in 2000, uh, 2020, things are different now. And there's no reason everybody can't do this. There's no thing like, oh, no, no. You just say, time to change. You can, do you know how easy it is to say to patients now? If we can keep this tooth 10 more years and then do our implant, think what we've done for you. That's right. Because implants are not for, you know, my selling points when I give my courses now to people or used to be, I changed my title to be just how to, can we maintain this tooth 10 more years to give that much more time to the implant? And that's how I used to talk to my patients. And, and then the terrible thing is we just didn't lose the tooth. See, it was all about, well, you know, we, and then we couldn't lose the tooth to be there 20 years later. So it's kind of like, you, once you start following biology, teeth don't want to get lost so often. But I understand, and I'm not against it. Okay, good. It's team. Do you want to talk about instrument preference for a split thickness flap, how you do it? Um, I use a 15 blade for the top and a 12 D I think for the bottom. double, double ended, uh, 12 for the bottom oh, C or D, is D? Yeah. Yeah, no, B. B, whatever, 15 <laughs> C for the top. You do it the same way I did. I didn't know that. Yeah, double ended 12. <laughs> right. Okay, good. Uh, let's I'll, I'll say one thing. Yeah. Now, when you start your flap, if you take your finger and you put on the outside of your inside of the mouth, but, and pull down that flap wants to pull away. Yeah. And you can split it with nothing. You put tension on the flap and it actually just splits like butter. Yes, it will. Um, let's see. Where can we learn your surgery techniques? Um, I think there's a lot of periodontists that can do it. And, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't have an answer. If um, Maybe if you look at and the online version of Advanced Period is like 18 bucks. And you can look at that as a good starting thing. I. You there? You? there no, it's Peter, but I was, that's you. You're losing me. You go there? I don't know. Do you hear me? All right, whatever. Anyhow, that's, you're, I'm looking at you. Are you looking at me? I, I, I'll look at you right now. There you are. Okay. Anyhow, 
Uh, my screen, look at you, but um, that would be a good start. Um, I, I don't even know what to say there. That would be a good start. Okay. Do you find allograph exposure for building out connective tissue on root prominence to be as good as autogenous over the long term? Do you yeah, find yeah. allograph plus, yeah. ex plus exposure yeah. for building yeah. out I, I would say that in my, just my opinion, nothing tops palatal tissue. I, I just never saw problems with palatal tissue. It's just the best. Um, as far as allograft tissue, I like it. Um, I, I will only say this, nothing's better than palatal tissue. If I could get it, that's what I would use. And I, I use periderm. I, I'm not a fond of alloderm. That's just my preference. But um, if I, I have to use periderm, I will, but I prefer, I prefer palatal tissue. I've never seen a palatal tissue not look better 30 years later. Good. Um, how do I know I did the barreling correctly? And I can tell you something you taught me. And that was go to the depth of the frication first and get that done first and then move out from well, there. Well, I, I think one thing that's important is to make sure you remove the line angles of the roots. Like, like we'll take a lower molar, but you can't just barrel in and come out, then you, you have a non-maintainable area. Oh, so you're you, absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So you have to, I mean, you have to work on the adjacent root surfaces, bringing it back. But remember I showed where I take the probe and I put it at the top, the coronal portion of the bone. And I said, when I come straight up, there's no frication left. Okay. So that would be, that's the way you tell. If you, if you stick it at the bone, you go in, there's still a frication there. When you stick it at the bone and nothing goes on, you go up, you've, the frication's gone. Okay. Uh, good. Um, question of the moderator, that's me. Uh, what's the link for the shared materials? Directorofdentistry.com slash learn, L-E-A-R-N. Uh, Dave Matthews says, nice, good to see super photography and well done surgery. Tell me about the baseball stuff in the background. Exactly. <laughs> he taught me everything. I, if everybody wants to learn this, just go to DaveMatthews.com. <laughs> he does. He knows twice as much as I know. Do you ever reline the temps? I never have ever relined a temp. You, you absolutely should not do that at surgery. That, that would be the biggest mistake. Because if you get any chemicals on the teeth or tissue, it's going to be a nightmare. But what we do is we fill the provisional up with, I use Tylock, which is like Duralon, all the way out. So that it's covered all the way out. I, you know, I didn't have time. I actually show the way I do it. But, you, you know, there was only so much time but you fill it up. It may be filled up with a millimeter and then they go back to their dentist at four weeks and he relines it. But I suggest no one ever relining a temper in my opinion at okay. surgery. Final question. Are there ever any cases where you leave the margin that's been prepared by the restorative dentist? Okay. I can answer that at 150%. Okay. Never. Good. I have Good. never ever left a previous margin. All right, the next final if question. If I did, it was a mistake. <laughs> You're right. All right, do labs have issues with finish lines and teeth where margins have been removed during shaping? If I understand correctly, proper shaping results in cleansability regardless of where the restoration finishes. Uh, this was great. Thanks so much. Do the labs have difficulty yeah, identifying where the margins are? Answer that, because let me be clear. There is no margin. When you biologically shape a tooth, there's no margin. You have a brand new surface to let the biologic with grow back coronally, and then you marginate just coronal to the CEJ, uh, excuse me, to the gingival collar. But there is no margin prior to that, none. When I shape, there's zero margin. Very good. None. But the restorative dentist does place a margin. Absolutely, a shape for margin. So the lab shouldn't have any weeks, At 12 to 14 weeks, he's going to get a perfect impression because it's a super gingival margin. And it's going to be a shape for margin, and there's only going to be one margin there because everything prior is going to be smooth. There, you know, there should be nothing prior. Apical to that margin, there's nothing. It's a perfectly smooth area that can be maintained by a hygienist and patient. Very good. Peter, any questions, comments? Uh, I have to say, Danny, that I've learned a lot watching you. It reconfirms a lot of things that I do and, and kind of opens my mind to some new things too. So. I like your protocol in terms of post-operative care for sensitivity. It all makes sense. All of your presentation makes sense to me, which is stuff, stuff you can put back into work when you go back 
whenever this COVID crisis is over, go back to put into practice. Well, coming from you, we all know, thank you so much. That's quite a compliment. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. Daniel, question about dealing with patients and yeah. patients come in asking for an implant, which, you know, when you and I first, Danielle used to be my surgical assistant and <laughs> she was my surgical assistant when I took your course. So she's gone from that to, to office manager and consultant. So first of all, the patients come in expecting to get an implant and I say, we can save the tooth. What kind of difficulty do you have and what do you have to do with the patient? Okay, in fairness, that would be unfair to me because I never placed an implant. So no one ever came to me for an implant. <laughs> in other words, I'm just being honest. I never had someone come in and think they would get an implant. I wouldn't know how to place an implant. I wouldn't know how to do them. So, but, but my basic goal was always to tell people that if I felt, you know, again, you realize if my guy could do a core, I could get 10 years out of the tooth. Yeah. I, that would be the, the worst I could do. And so our conversations were simple. If he says, I can't do a core, then don't send them to me. I'm not, you know, send them somewhere else. You had an implant done by someone else, but I, I, I don't need to do it. So the, the core tells us everything. And now I'm, I believe I'm saying this, I believe this wholeheartedly that the next 10 years, the next five years, that if we can start to bond with our restorative dentists like we should and, and work together, we can start saving a lot of teeth for people. Not that they won't be implants, but you're going to be shocked to how hard it's going to be for that tooth to be lost. But people are going to come in today and they're not going to have money. You know, they're going to come in in September and they're going to say, you know, that $80,000 or $50,000 or $25,000, I can't afford it. What can you do for me? If you want to say, well, then we'll just take your teeth out. Or you, you bond it with a guy and he says, hey, I've got this covered. I'll put cores on. We'll do provisionals and we can get five, 10 years out of it. And all of a sudden, your patients kind of look at you like, way to pull that off. You're my hero. Well, because to be honest with you, who wants to have teeth lost? Because you don't have money. I mean, and this isn't, I'm not saying this is cheap or anything, but it does, can help delaying implants 10 years. It really can. I, as I say, I've got them 25 and 30 years. In the case I showed you with Bill, where there was nothing left, that's working 12, 13 years now. Why well, won't it be 25 years? What's to stop it? You know, at 12 years, if it's nothing's probing and nothing's wrong, she may have, to, may have to have a crown replaced, but that's it. But yeah. I believe everything is, a rest I have to tell you, anybody that knows me since 2003 on the AAP forum, I've said one thing. I've never changed. It's a restorative world. Paranost must start to vote their time to, to their restorative guys and give them anything they want because we need them. They don't need us. We have to give them a reason to need us. And that is, we're gonna do everything so perfect for them that their cases are gonna last indefinitely. And then I'll say, yeah, I like working with you because you care about me more than you do. And one final thing, if I had a patient come into me for an exam and they needed eight, 10 crowns and they had perio and they said, well, I'll just do the perio now. I would say, I can't do the case. I would never do a case halfway. I'd say, go get, get frankly, I'd say, go to Periolase. I know a guy that'll, you know, clean up your infection, but your teeth are going to rot away. So I said, I did get Perio, you know, like, and everything rotted away. So, you know, no, you know, I, I'm a, like, I believe this is a great opportunity. It's a sad time. Don't get me wrong, but it's an opportunity for us to, to, to get back with our restorative dentist where we should have been for the last 20 years. And there's incredibly gifted restorative dentists out there. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Very good, Danny. Um, Danielle, what, what about patient management standpoint? Is there anything that you've encountered that you can share with the group or anything that they need to be aware of? Well, I mean, in, in our practice, it is a little differently. Patients do come to our practice to get implants, but many of times, many, many of times, you know, when you tell them, listen, you know, if, if I were you or if you were my daughter or my mother, I would have you do this biological shaping first and get 5, 10, 15, 30 years out of it and then come back for an implant because you, you, you can always go to an implant after this. You can't go to this after an implant. So whenever you are um, advocating to the patient and, and explaining to them that, you know, just do this one first, let's see if we can make it work. I don't think they're ever going to tell you no. I mean, we have had patients adamant on implants because they believe in the implants, but it's up to us to educate them like Dr. Melker just did. 
to say, I don't think it's the best thing for you right now. And they listen and they appreciate that. And I do believe after these times right now, yes, people are not going to jump into things like that as much. They don't have the money. Uh, they are a little bit more skeptical and they're, uh, they, I do think this is going to be something that is going to be great for patients to save those teeth and then go to implants if we, if we can't do it or if it doesn't last very long. So I think it's exciting to be able to present this to patients. I think the one, the, the other thing that, that we found both here and, and when we go out in, in offices is exactly what Danny said and what I try to say, and Peter, I'm sure it's the same way. What comes from the doctor is really what the patient will listen to no matter what the patient's preconceived notions are. But we have to be definite in the way we make, we make our presentation. Oh, that's, a, that's a great point. I say this to everybody, if you don't believe in it, do you really think you're gonna make somebody else believe in it? Mm -hmm. sure. And that's, I mean, you have to seriously believe that you're talking because you know you're right. Because when you talk, you know you, and you think, and you know you're right, the patient knows that. They can tell. And when they know you're really only interested in them, it's kind of like, you'd be surprised how many people say, I'm not doing anything. And then a day later, they call up and schedule everything. You know. I've had people when I said, no, I can't do the perio, they walk out, they go, they've said nasty things like, wow, well, you don't even care about me. And then a week later, someone will call and say, she's all in provisionals. She's ready to go for surgery. When she left my place, like she wanted no part of it because I wouldn't do the surgery. And I'm not saying, and I'll tell you what I believe, whatever. I think Lenap's going to be very important coming up. I think it's, it's a way of at least getting the inflammation under control. And I think a lot of people are going to be hesitant to do a lot of things that we were going to do and that a good periodontist, and I say periodontist because to me, Lenap, there's more than just what they do. Periodontists really understand biology. And then if they apply a periolase or whatever they use, I, I, I would, I'm not against that. You know, people always said, oh, he's against lasers. No, I'm not. I just think there's a time they should be used. <laughs> I, I don't think they should be used and then you do crowns on them. But I think we're going to have to come up with alternatives to keeping teeth. I think it's going to be a whole different world for the next two or three years, maybe. And I think we, we can arise to it. We, we are, and I have to say this, periodontists know more about biology, microbiology, histology, all the things that make us, that separated us from everybody else. And if we just go back to the basics, that's all I did. I don't think I showed you anything that wasn't basic here. That's all I do. I, Morris Rubin, you know, the, the R geniuses were not the guys that I liked. The, the guys that taught me, Sik Sikransky, more of these guys have heard. Morris Rubin, these were the guys we disliked. Who want to know about microbiology, Peter? You know what I'm saying? Ah, what is that? And now today, my whole life is based on understanding how to avoid the immune response. You know, like, and so I just say, we can, Pernos are incredible. And, and we have the knowledge. We just have to decide. Let's, let's go and use all that we learned, because we learned a hell of a lot. I tried not to. So if I learned it, I'm sure it would help. <laughs> yeah. All right, Danny, it was a fabulous presentation. Great. Thank you. Peter, Thank you. Danielle, thanks. Uh, thanks for, I, 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 this, uh, I think this has blown people away, and the number well, of people who stayed on for this entire session, just as testimony to. Well, how, I will send, I will send for everybody, I'm going to send. Cores, suturing, desensitizing, and diamonds. Those were my three requests, and I will send them to you in five minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Director of Peter, com slash learn. Peter, thank, thank you. Are. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll try to do another one next Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.